my name is Ian Aber, and this is Straight People. Uh, we're joined uh, this week. We are back uh, recording Straight People in uh, my home uh, studio, which is a, the basement of our house, and the, this is where all the the art that people gave us that we don't like uh, hangs. <laughs> uh, we are joined this week by uh, my good friend and Atlanta comedian uh, Madison Ursek. How are you doing? I'm doing really well. Thank awesome. you. Awesome. Um, I did pronounce your name correctly. Finally, you did. <laughs> you did. <laughs> uh, the joke is, is that I knew Madison for almost what an entire year. Yeah. And I kept calling you uh, Madison E. Craig. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. And you just were like, one day you're like. Oh, you know what? By the way, hey, my name is Ursa. <laughs> <laughs> I just am someone that like never speaks up about anything. Yeah. And I was like, I'm sure, you know, I probably even, maybe I introduced myself as that. So I was like, it's, <laughs> it's not his fault. And so it's fine. <laughs> maybe when you introduced yourself to me, you mispronounced your name. Is what you're yeah, saying? That, okay. that was that the justification. Like that, was, that seems like that was probably what happened, right? Um, but uh, I'm I'm famous like I'm terrible about that like in terms of like seeing a name and just like my brain doesn't get it decides like this is yeah, what yeah. that says. It just said I saw E C and G. It was like E Cray. It's E Cray. Um, <laughs> and I was that way when I was a kid because I lived in the South and my name's Ian and I A N on the page just doesn't read correctly to a lot of people. So I'd have teachers who would call me Ian like all year and yeah. then at the end they'd be like, Why'd you tell me my name was your name was A? And I'm, I was like, I never knew you were talking to me. I didn't know. <laughs> like I was called Ann a lot like that was my Ann <laughs> Ann that's how southern people say Ann <laughs> Ann but um so you're on a podcast called straight people mm-hmm. are you how do you are you a straight person are I you, am yeah, yeah I'm a straight person I've been listening to your act and I feel like I, I would guess that you're straight mm-hmm. but you never know some people are like I thought about a girl once so I'm bisexual where's my you know yeah <laughs> I find I don't know I kind of question just in general if like does anyone not have that thought at some point in their life? Well, I think that it's more co- more acceptable and comfortable for women mm-hmm. to identify it that way than men. But I find that more men are doing it, too. So, like, this mm-hmm. podcast really has been kind of a... I've learned a lot about bisexual people, you know, like that, you know, you don't have to act on it, you know, just the thought of it, the mm-hmm. you know, the constant being attracted to both sexes is its own form of sexuality whether you're acting out on it or not you know? right i think people are being more honest about it now too yeah, absolutely yeah. so i think that yeah in the long run it'll be like you know uh you know every, somebody's great great grandkids everybody will be bisexual right. and biracial and you know what i mean so it'll be perfect <laughs> it'll be the perfect the perfect land um and how long have you been in atlanta i've been in atlanta about three three and a half years yeah and yeah. What, what brought you to atlanta originally so i was living in la um and i went to school out there and then i stayed for like two and a half, three years afterwards. And I was doing the like acting thing and yeah. working a bunch of jobs and I was super miserable and I hated it so much. <laughs> <laughs> and my best friend who I was living with at the time, she had representation out here. Okay. And so she was booking a lot, but then as they kind of cracked down more on those, um, local hire laws, because okay. before you could just be like, yeah, I live in Atlanta and live in LA and it yeah. would, just didn't matter. Okay. So they've started like cracking down on that more so once they did she's from here yeah Yeah. exactly because it's like a bunch of la actors were just taking atlanta people jobs which has kind of defeated the purpose of having this out here i guess it's true that makes sense but yeah um so what we what what kind of jobs did you do in la what was the most miserable job you had (laughs) so many so many miserable jobs well i was a casino crap stealer (laughs) for a company called (laughs) dealer dolls wow you know uh the craps table has a whole different meaning at the gay bar just so you know does it yeah everyone when, if you're ever at a gay bar and someone goes, do you want to see the crabs table? Pass. It's not a good. <laughs> Wait, will you break it down for me? <laughs> well, crabs. I'm joking. I'm joking. It's a joke. I'm making a joke. But, so where, where, what casino was that? So basically it was like a traveling company that did okay. charity events. Oh, God. Yeah. So I would have to wear like during the holidays I'd wear like a Santa outfit Santa's <laughs> helper and these like fishnet stockings oh my god are there pictures of that on your Instagram uh, no maybe I don't know they might all be deleted by wow. now <laughs> Wow. I'll actually, I'll post one on my, I actually think I posted it on my story the other day. That's funny. Yeah. So, or we'd wear, wear these like. Would you get good tips though? You'd be surprised yeah. at how stiff people can be with tips for things like that. Yeah. You're at a charity event. You figure that they would be like, yeah. the money would be good. Right? They, they're stiff about tips, but then very serious about the fake money that they're playing <laughs> with. <laughs> Cause like, obviously since we were like just these like cute girls who were doing this for these events, our training was like really good, but also yeah. like I am terrible at math. So yeah. I was like doing a lot of like finger counting behind the table. <laughs> so like sometimes there'd be mistakes oh, and people wow. were 
not, not having not it. Not having it. Wow. I remember we did a show a couple of years ago. It was a local guy who produced it, and it was a it was at a like an, where they sold ATVs and like outdoor stuff. It was like a big big superstore like that, yeah. and it was their holiday party. And before uh, oh, so what they had the whole night was casino night like that uh-huh. you're describing. Yeah. They came in and and they were all for raffle tickets. They were all competing for raffle tickets. Mm-hmm. And then right before it was announced, you got the week you know two weeks paid vacation in Hawaii and the giant TV and the whatever. Yeah, yeah. They they were like, here's a comedy show, and they like they, they couldn't have not wanted us more. <laughs> so we were the only thing between them and their prizes, and they were all right. drunk and checking just, their watches. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> they were like they they kept like trying to applaud us off after the first. So you'd be like, hey, how you guys doing tonight? That was awesome. That was Yay, great. Thank you Next so much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it was a lot of like company parties. Oh wow, yeah. that's crazy. Um, and then so that was is that the worst or? Um, well, I'd say the worst. I did. I worked briefly. I'd say about a week for a photo booth company. Okay. Um, and while I was there it was like a two dude team running it and one of the guys was like cool so now you can start working for our other company um which is where here these are the outfits that you should buy and it was all like <laughs> lingerie and i was very confused like what i had gotten myself into so yeah. it was la was just a lot of that wow yeah a lot of like oh so you actually e- oh no, <laughs> that's not what I signed up for. Wow. Yeah. And that's how they do it. They just kind of like trick you into it, basically. Yeah, like here's this job where you can get paid $50 an hour to set up photo booth stuff. Yeah. But like also we can try to pick you up and spin you around and <laughs> get you to try to wear lingerie. <laughs> I was like, what? Wow. Yeah. Um, so Atlanta, and you've been in Atlanta for three and a half years, mm-hmm. been doing stand up, been killing it, been killing it. Don't thank you. Um, yeah. Uh, what would you say, like, what's it like to go from like open mic to getting up regularly around town and you're producing shows and mm. um, what do you think, you know, as a woman, do you think that there's, uh, still like a completely separate kind of like track in terms of like the things you have to deal with like mm. being hit on or whatever it is um, that kind of like comes along with being a comic I think even just kind of internally sometimes there's a bit of like an imposter syndrome that happens with me and that's something I've struggled with forever yeah. but I think as a woman it's a little bit intensified because it's like you know maybe I haven't been doing comedy for as long as some of the guys that are still working the open mic circuit yeah. a little bit more um, and so there is kind of this battle of like, are people all wondering if I'm supposed to be doing these shows and, you know, <laughs> and the whole time and then you just undermine yourself. And, oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's so funny how like, I don't, I don't know anyone who doesn't have a little bit of the imposter mm-hmm. syndrome and not just comics, not just artists, but like everybody has that to an degree. Um, but you know, it's like, you can always convince yourself you don't deserve something mm. you know what i mean it's very hard to talk yourself into being like oh yeah i, I do need yeah. you know I, I do have value you know what <laughs> i mean like all it takes is one bad show to just totally confirm all the lies in your head yeah you absolutely know? well like sometimes someone will just say something it, and sometimes they mean it as a compliment and but the way i hear it i'm like oh you know what i mean right. so like i forget somebody said somebody recently said that i sounded like another comic and it was a compliment because the other comics a great comic right but the way i heard it was like you're not original and i was just like you know for a day right. like looking at all my material i was just like that's gone well that's gone i'm not doing that joke anymore isn't that a funny thing <laughs> where like as comedians we don't want to be told we're like other comedians but sometimes i like have the desire to tell other comics they're like one of my favorite comics yeah. which I don't want to receive, but yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, it's like the, um, one of the things I learned really early was that even when people tell you they like your jokes, that can be a problem sometimes (laughs) because if somebody, if everyone comes up and says they, I I used to do this, I did did this one joke (laughs) where I did an impression of Maya Angelou singing 90s karaoke. And it's really dumb. It's a very short joke. But that was, when I did that joke for a while, that was the joke that everyone would come up and go, oh, I love that joke. And what it made me feel like was that was the hacky, that, you know what I mean? That's uh, the joke you're known for. And so I need to stop doing that joke. Interesting. Yeah, and I think Mandel, you know, Mandel's a comic in the Atlanta scene who had that. Remember for a while, he would do that comedy game joke. And oh, it was yeah. like, and then then he had all of this like trepidation whether he should, should do, do it, it or, not. or not do it. And people were such a fan of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah to the point where he, it, he, it bothered him that they mentioned it so much, mm-hmm. and I was like, and I think it was like, it took me a second to realize, oh, I did that myself. Mm-hmm. I had a joke just the same way, and it's like, the more people talk about it, the more people say, oh yeah, that one's great. You're like, well, what about all the other ones? What about the one I wrote today? Right. You know? 
<laughs> for me, it's like people would have a takeaway that wasn't even exactly like, you're the girl that has all the Catholic schoolgirl jokes, right? And I'm like, I didn't even go to Catholic school. I don't know. <laughs> that's, I'm glad that's the takeaway you had. <laughs> that's funny. Well, you know, you said, not to give too much of your act away, yeah. but you talked about having IBS in your act, uh, right? Uh, and you said something about working at the craps table, and I almost <laughs> made a joke right there, but I don't want to give it away. But um, but let's circle back, because I'm really terrible about keeping on topic of this podcast, uh, which is about uh, straight people uh, and the, uh. dis- the decline of straight culture and the end of straight people as we know it. Um, you know, fingers crossed. But... Um, <laughs> That's for anybody who complains that, like, why is it called straight people? Why can't you do you just do podcasts about gay people? And I'm like, I am gay. I don't know. You're like, like a, I already right. know all that, you know? <laughs> but um, so what I love to ask straight people is because you don't know you're straight. You're mm-hmm. just born regular and, like, you know, like <laughs> the way God wanted you and stuff. <laughs> um, but then at some point you realize that gay exists somehow, right? Mm -hmm. So what was the first, like, do you remember, like, meeting the first gay person you met or, like, maybe the first gay character you saw on a TV show or heard Mm -hmm. about gay or heard someone call someone else gay as an insult? Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like, because it's usually one of those kind of three things, you know? Well, what's so interesting is I, I don't know that I remember the first time that I had seen it because it was so foreign to the world that I was in to be really surrounded. Yeah. Um, Surrounded. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But I just, I never had any kind of interpersonal relationships with anyone that was gay. So it almost just, I don't know that I remember the first moment, but I do remember my first like relationship with a gay person. And that was something that just like shattered the world that I had grown up in because it just, I feel like that's kind of the thing with, any kind of any kind of lack of knowledge really stems from a lack of personal connection with someone yeah. who is having that experience and so like it's hard to find any points of connection until you do you know yeah. um so when people stay in their own little bubble they just don't even really think about it and it's so easy to dismiss so yeah i would say like the my first like really good friend in college who was gay it was kind of just like one of those life changing moments for me of like, Oh man, I've been so like, I just didn't even realize yeah. how wrong, <laughs> like all of the, like the way that I grew up was in that regard, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, and who was that? Do you want to talk about that person at all? Like, uh, yeah. yeah. So I, um, I grew up doing theater, which is what originally brought me to LA. So I majored in theater in college. Okay. Um, but it's funny cause at my private Christian school, no one, at least at the time, identified as being gay. So, you know, you think about theater, someone in theater, and I was like, I didn't know any gay people. I grew up in theater. Um, I believe that the church is so theatrical in general that there's always a (laughs) sexual somewhere. They're running the choir. They're playing the organ. Uh, You know what I mean? Somebody's somebody's there doing something. Uh, Yeah. So so in college, yeah, my friend, um, his name is Rudy, and he's just like such an amazing person. And it just I remember having these late night conversations with him where he would just like ask me these questions that were so heartbreaking and I couldn't answer them of like okay so like you identify as a Christian so like what do you think about my lifestyle (laughs) and it was like you know he was like one of my good friends I know he wasn't trying to trap me he was genuinely like I don't know how you and I can have this kind of deep personal relationship if you actually deep down have maybe these thoughts about me yeah and I kind of had to really like come face to face with those things like what do I I don't know I guess I'd never really questioned it before you know um and kind of since then it's been something I've been more proactive about like yeah well that you're even willing to have those conversations you know Mm -hmm. Uh, I kind of laugh at him asking that (laughs) because it's like we call it that dragging somebody you know what I mean so Mm -hmm. it's like you do that a little bit with your straight friends Mm -hmm. to kind of test the waters to see exactly Mm -hmm. you know you know you know how how um how much do you actually like gay people mm. and how much is this is a novelty to you because mm. i've definitely had the experience of like having a straight friend who really didn't know a damn thing about gay people mm. at all and would say things constantly that i was just like you know do you, you know what is it about gay people that you want to hang out with them because right. you don't really see them as equals you just still were right. like a, like a fetish of some sort or mm. or just this you know like I can say I have gay friends and that makes me more interesting. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of that sometimes. Yeah. Um, So that's great. That's awesome. You know? Um, And then you've lived in LA and Atlanta. I mean, two pretty gay cities, Mm -hmm. you know, we've got so many gay people uh, in both of those cities. Um, Do you find 
uh, since doing stand up, like what's your any of your opinions have changed about because like we have a lot of queer comics come through Atlanta mm-hmm. and in Atlanta, um, and uh, do you do you think that you've learned more or about queer people as a result of doing comedy or being involved in the arts in general? Yeah, uh, I yeah. think so. Just in it's kind of more of that same thing of like I just have been getting to know so many more people, and the more people I know, and the more like my heart is invested in the issue because I care so much about these people, you know, and these friendships that I just like my ears and my heart are more open to hearing things that maybe I couldn't even receive before because, you know, there just was, there was no connection there. Um, and I think that that's kind of one of the things just about like when people have these biases in general of, and like, or stereotype people or whatever, it's like, I almost always think it comes down to not going out and intentionally having deep connections with people and like conversations. Yeah. Cause it's so easy to just like, you know, sit in your little corner and not listen to what anyone has to say. If you don't have any kind of personal connection to anyone or no investment. Yeah. yeah. yeah I agree with that. I think that's true. Um, and a lot of the folks that I've talked to who seem to have the, that there's so little kind of like, uh, issue to them about gay, gay people is, is the ones that grew up around gay people. Mm-hmm. So like I, we had Norlex Belma on here and he was in uh, music mm-hmm. all his life and it's like he, there was always gay people around him mm-hmm. in the music industry and it's so like as an adult then there's no like having to understand what a gay person is right. because it's always contextually been a part of mm-hmm. the world you lived in. And I grew up kind of more sheltered um, geographically a little bit too because we lived mm-hmm. in Guam and we were Catholic, and then, like it was very like anybody who was effeminate or any of that kind of stuff was like, mm-hmm. that's a bad person. You need to stay away from that. You know what I mean? And it's yeah. like it was very drilled in that it was not just like different. It was wrong. It right. was wrong behavior. Um, and I always find that's interesting because like that is something that once you meet like you know once you meet a gay person who has no interest in like turning you gay or right. whatever it is, whatever evil thing we're supposed to do, then it's like, well, you know, what else about this religion that I've been raised in is not true? Right. <laughs> you know? And that's been like yeah. a lifelong thing for me <laughs> of like, you know, growing up in it and then like having these like beliefs and trying to parcel out like everything from my childhood, like what I want to keep and what I want to reject. Yeah. And like the same being true with like religion and faith. Like, okay, what parts of that were like kind of tied up in the way that I grew up and things that I am rejecting and what part of that is genuine and yeah. like, you know. Because so. a lot of your material sort of about that, about how you were mm-hmm. made, you were expected to be one type of person mm-hmm. and any area where you weren't that type of person, well, you were made to feel guilty or be punished or ostracized in some capacity, which is a very uh, analogous to the queer experience, I think, mm-hmm. you know. Like that's something that I've noticed in your material for sure is that mm-hmm. you're an outsider inside of this group that you belong to, Mm -hmm. you know? And not feeling like sometimes you belong to even like one group or the other. Like, I just feel like I have two feet in, or (laughs) I have two feet in one world and two feet in the other. (laughs) Well, you're a comedian, so you don't belong to anything. You're just a a scumbag working for chicken wings like the rest of us. (laughs) So you also had a very interesting thing in the sense that you, so you, you, Came here, started doing stand-up comedy, mm-hmm. but you had to have a surgery in the last couple of years, right? In the last year, yeah. because you had a paralyzed vocal cord, right? Mm-hmm. And it really affected how you were able to do stand-up for for a little while. Yeah. You want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So I didn't know that I had a paralyzed vocal cord until I was in theater in high school and was working on a monologue for like a college audition. And yeah. um they just were like, I need you to be louder. I need you to be louder. And we just kind of had a breakdown moment of like, I cannot be louder than this. Yeah. Um, so going and learning that I had the paralyzed vocal cord, which the way that it's paralyzed is it was very unique in that usually if you're, uh, it's like some accident that will happen that will cause the paralysis or you'll be born with it in one way, in which case you can't really speak very well at all. Okay. But my body had adjusted um, to have the one that wasn't paralyzed kind of swing all the way over and okay. connect, which yeah. is why I didn't know for so long that I had had the paralysis. So which one was it, left or the right? Uh, or the, the left. So old lefties just been doing all the work. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so when I finally like learned about it, originally I had some nodules from like trying to work so hard, so they yeah. had to remove those laser when okay. I was in high school. Um, but then they had, they're like, there is the surgery, but it's like the doctor at the time was like, it's not, you know, it's kind of dangerous. You already have more 
sound than people would hope for at the end of the surgery. Okay. So I just don't think the worst the risk is worth it. Yeah. Um, so I just kind of dismissed the idea. And then when I was about to be off my parents' insurance last yeah. year, <laughs> I was like, maybe I should go in and have the old vocal cord just yeah. checked out again, make yeah. sure we're good. And he was like, well, you do know that there is a surgery. And I was like, yeah, but it's dangerous. And blah, blah, blah. I was like, I don't know. What, who told you that? But it's yeah. actually like super routine. I do it like almost every day. Um, Interesting. Yeah. I wonder if it's like because like some of that stuff in a year or two years it changes so drastically. Yeah. You know, like that with the person who gave you the warning was somebody who just never done it. You know. Yeah. Or like yeah. if they had at the time, like maybe it was a little riskier because I was yeah. like eight to ten. Almost, yeah, yeah. A little long ago. Um, so yeah, then I did the surgery and because basically yeah, with stand up people would have to like boost my mic. Yeah. You know? And like or if I you know, which is fine if I'm at a club that you I'm familiar were super, with. You were like raspy. Yeah. Like, you still have a little tiny a bit little of rasp. it. But you were like you always sounded like you were like you had just got done laughing a bunch and then you were, you were like <laughs> Which is how my laugh sounded as well. It still Absolutely. sounds a little bit like that, but yeah. uh. <laughs> <laughs> But it was cool because it's like you didn't sound like anybody else. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and so they would turn your mic up. I had the opposite problem. They mm. used to turn my mic all the way off <laughs> when I did the skull for a long time. And I would bomb everywhere else. And then one day to Ben, I was like, why does it work here and it doesn't work anywhere else? He goes, oh, well, you know we turn the mic down every time you get on stage, right? And I was like, no, I don't no, know that. No, no, you told me. know that. Yeah. <laughs> but that made the biggest difference. Like the minute I knew that, that mm. changed how everything else worked for me. Yeah. yeah. And for me, there's been... It's like it was a balance of the self-awareness of the way I did sound sometimes, yeah. though, worked against me and that, like, my throat would kind of close up more and oh, yeah. seize up more, so less sound would come out. Yeah. And I still, that's something I'm, like, going through physical therapy for because, yeah. like, my things technically are functioning now, but my body is so used to thinking, like, talking equals embarrassing, tension, close okay. up. Yeah. So it still is doing that sometimes. Oh, wow. Okay. So I'm having to So you're doing, like, speech therapy or? Yeah. I'm okay. not doing as much as I <laughs> <laughs> but the idea is that like uh yeah the more that i do that i can like retrain my vocal cord to be okay. like no i'm healthy i'm normal i can nice. talk like a normal person so do they give you like exercises to do can you, mm-hmm. can you tell i know that uh, one will be funny. my favorite <laughs> one um for those listening which all of you are uh <laughs> it's um tongue between the lips a little something like <laughs> <laughs> so I try to do it in my car, okay. um, so that people will look in and yeah, exactly. feel uncomfortable. Yeah, exactly. See you going. <laughs> so she just stuck her tongue out of her mouth between her lips and made farting noises. Mm. So that's her. Yeah, <laughs> that's gonna change the game for my voice. <laughs> right. So no um, um, red le- leather, yellow leather, none of that. Uh, honestly, if I went more, probably I would have okay. more of those exercises. I'm still stuck on but level it's a, one. It's, it's like a, originally when you had it done, it was almost indetectable a little bit, mm-hmm. and now like it's really like yeah. you have a full speaking voice. You don't sound like you're winded. You don't sound like you're scared. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like it was always like you're sort of like sound nervous w- on stage. telling me a secret. You know yeah. what I mean? Like every time I talk to you, you'd be which would make <laughs> the audience feel like super, I think, uncomfortable yeah. because it's like, oh my gosh, she looks, yeah. she sounds yeah. so nervous. Yeah, yeah. She must be really not confident, yeah. which was true, but yeah. it made it worse. <laughs> uh, <laughs> do you think? Do you do you notice the difference on stage now? Do you do you feel more comfortable? Yeah. Um, and do you? Are, is there a difference in the response you're getting to you? Like. It's one thing to feel confidence, but are you feeling the, like, the, the are the jokes landing better? Or is your mm. delivery different? I think, and it's funny because I think they're probably so closely connected, but I definitely feel like I have more of a, like, commanding presence on yeah. stage, um, which I think the audience responds to better than before. But obviously, having that presence makes me feel more confident, which I think it's yeah. all this cycle. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's like, is it truly a confidence game alone, you know? Yeah. Well, what I would say is that probably with your vocal cord in the situation it was then, you didn't have a lot of room to modulate hmm. and play with the delivery, mm-hmm. which with a full voice, I bet you're going to be able to have more of that. And you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Get quiet and get loud. Because it's like, if you're worried that you're never loud enough, then how do you ever scream in a joke? How do you ever right. show full anger? If you know or whatever, right. you know, the so. screaming is something in life. I'm still trying to figure out how to like incorporate <laughs> into life because <laughs> well, I talk about it on stage, yeah. like emergency situations and things like that were kind of really what made me finally decide to get the surgery because in those situations, I just I didn't have any ability to make loud noises. Yeah. Um, so the ability to do that, I think, is like super necessary. If you if you have the option, then you should. Yeah. Um, so but I still don't know how to scream. 
or to yell loudly. <laughs> My body had just never been able to do it. Just it just doesn't get there. Yeah. So what's the what's the loudest you think you've gotten since you? Um, I think that I I was riding a horse yesterday, okay. and there was a long line of people, and I would say there's probably like seven horses, and the person in the front was asking me a question, and I was <laughs> able to answer it. <laughs> and that it was funny. My boyfriend turned to me. He was like, "That's amazing. You were able to answer that question." I was like, "I know." Uh, <laughs> you are the Little Mermaid. It's yeah, amazing. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> um, so what are your what are your kind of like your so you're in Atlanta. You're still auditioning mm-hmm. for stuff. You're still so what's your dream? What's your so like tomorrow yeah. the dream role fell into your lap what would it be or or what would it be would it be to go on tour with a you know a headlining comic mm. would it be a headliner yourself would it be an acting gig um, would it be that you just want to get married and have kids? <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> Please there. not that one. Please the not that straight. One. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Have my straight little babies and tell them to be straight. Um. I mean, that's something I've actually been like trying to figure out a lot because I, this past year, actually, it was around the time of the surgery. I was yeah. just questioning a lot of things in life. And I officially, quote unquote, quit acting, yeah. which is something I've been doing since seventh grade um, and had, you know, invested my college funds and all of that yeah. into was this future and i realized after doing stand up that i just the the freedom of being able to like have control over the the person that was being put out there um because yeah. in, in acting i was just being put up for these roles and none of them were anything like me yeah um so the ability to control that and to have a voice once you experience that, I don't know, at least for me, there was no going back. Yeah. So the idea of playing a part that I didn't want to play just like <laughs> held nothing for me anymore, you know? That's funny. Um, so technically not acting. Not anymore. acting? Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, that's interesting to hear. I didn't yeah. know that about you. Yeah. I thought you were still kind of like in the game, but. When I would get auditions, but I was. Isn't that sort of the point of acting that the, the roles aren't like you, though? Isn't that you get lost yeah, in that? Or that's you're, true. I don't but know. I guess. Maybe it is a confidence thing because so many of them. Because I'm blonde again, but I, you know, I wasn't for a while. <laughs> and when I was in LA, I was blonde, and I yeah. would walk into these rooms with all these like tall, skinny oh, yeah. blonde girls, and it'd be like for the part of Svetlana. Yeah, you know, that's <laughs> like you know, you're gonna play like the sexy minx, and like that's just not my personality at all. <laughs> and I, I would get so anxious. Like that's wow. like, I want to play like some weird goofy role. See, now I want to see you audition for the role of like, what would your sexy <laughs> You would see a lot of sweating and a lot of blushing. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Even in like real life, I can't take that seriously. There's always got to be some kind of like, ah, this is a bit that I'm <laughs> doing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I know I, that I definitely understand. That's so funny. So then, what? Just tell me your. What are you doing? What's your next thing that's for you? Right. For you're going to do some touring. You're going to go to New York. You're going to go to LA. You're going to. What are you going to do for stand up next? Yeah. I'll put you on the spot. Make so, a goal so that way I can be like a year is, later. Did she do? You know, <laughs> yeah, I want to have a. This is a kind of a. I want to have a clean hour. So like nice. the writing process right now, I think is what I'm focusing nice. on, and not because I have any feelings either way about clean versus not clean, because none of my material has ever been clean since yeah. I've started. But I just like the idea of being able to like reach more people. Yeah, I guess yeah. is like super and attractive more, and to me. Working more, you yeah. know. Well, I think it probably didn't didn't hurt that you just saw. Jeff Foxworthy do an hour. Like he was just right. at the Laughing Skull, and we both saw that. And it's like, well, you you know, you can have some clean at least, right? Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Even yeah. if it's not like everything that's my that thing. I it's do. Like I'm trying to get build up to a half an hour. I've got about mm-hmm. 15 minutes. And I'm trying to build up to that half hour of like as squeaky clean as I can get it. Um, but not that's not even my favorite material. Right. You know? Like find a way to still be yourself. Yeah. Yeah, that's the part that I'm kind of trying to figure out is, like, I want to still be, like, super transparent, and I'm not, like, a squeaky clean kind of person. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Because as we hear often in the news, the people that are super squeaky clean often aren't super squeaky clean (laughs) off uh, camera. Yeah, exactly. Usually that's just a setup. Yeah. Um, Okay, cool. We're getting towards the end of this. I'm going to ask you uh, my favorite question that I've been asking since I started this mess. Um, you're a straight person. Uh-huh. What do straight people eat? Like, what's a straight, like, a straight meal? Like, when straight people get together and they're all like, we're straight, what are they eating? I think straight people love eggs, <laughs> bacon, and toast. Okay. And no seasoning on this, any Just of brekkies, it. just uh-huh. breakfast in Just general. a nice American breakfast. A big old American breakfast. Uh-huh. A mess of eggs, a mess of bacon, a bunch of white toasted bread. Mm-hmm. I'm into that. 
Yeah. I'm into that. Just I'm a, bland. That's what I grew up on. Bland. Uh-huh. Like we, my 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 family liked it. You know. Oh, why you gotta put anything on it? It's it's already. <laughs> it's you know, perfect. It has got made it. A, yeah. yeah. Exactly. <laughs> it came out of a chicken's body. It's delish. <laughs> um, tell me where people can find you. Um, so on Instagram, Madison dot which is E R C E G. Not E Craig, but Ursig. Um, and that's really all. I mean, I have a website, yeah. but it. And you run a monthly at the Laughing Skull a day a day show. Tell I us, do. Tell us about that. Yeah. So basically, in Atlanta, for people that aren't familiar with the comedy scene out here, it is sometimes hard to find those longer sets. Yep. Um, and to be able to work out that material before actually doing it, like for a big gig, so you have to go out of town. So I started a show called Afternoon Delight, the third Saturday of every month at the Laughing Skull, where people can kind of work 20, 25 minute sets. Yep. That's a Saturday five o'clock show. Mm-hmm. Is that right? Okay, yep. cool. And the next one is, uh, it's actually, we're doing this time. It's the second Saturday. So Six. it's going to be, the, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, I'm very well, check consistent. out laughing school lounge.com yeah. for upcoming shows and show times. Uh, Madison, that's been great. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, my name's Ian neighbor and this has been straight people. Thank you. Ian.